So one way or the other, curves are going to steepen, right? In in the mini banking crisis that we had, it was a bull steepener. Uh, the last six weeks, it's been a bear steepener, right? Because inflation expectations have uh, become more elevated and the, the higher for longer regime is being priced into global fixed income. So we think there's tremendous risk reward there. And that's an area that we've traded around uh, quite substantially. Again, it's not speculating on duration. It's just saying the probability of the yield curve steepening is excessively high and you're at some of the most extreme levels of inversion in history other than the 70s or early 80s. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary investors from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Alan Dunn, to host a series of in-depth conversations on the topic of what it takes to be a world-class allocator. In today's world, portfolio construction is fast moving to the top of the agenda of many investors as they try to analyze and understand the riskiness of their portfolios. And with ever-increasing uncertainty around the globe, being well-diversified across many different strategies and themes in your portfolio can mean the difference between ruin and survival when the next crisis emerge. The aim of these conversations is to try and understand the experiences that have influenced these highly specialized allocators and the processes they follow to harness the best returns for their clients so that we can all become better informed investors. And with that... Please welcome Alan Dunn. Thanks very much for that introduction, Niels. Uh, Today I'm delighted to be joined by Troy Gajewski. Troy is Chief Market Strategist at FS Investments. FS Investments is a global alternative asset manager. The firm manages over $75 billion in assets for a wide range of clients, including institutional investors and individual investors. Troy is Chief Market Strategist and is responsible for research generation and conveying the full suite of alternative investments at FS Investments. Uh, Prior to joining FS Investments, Troy was an allocator in a variety of different roles, running fund of funds and institutional separate managed accounts. And he's also been a frequent contributor to Bloomberg and Fox and Yahoo Finance and CNBC. Troy, great to have you with us today. How are you doing? Uh, doing great, Niels. Doing great. Uh, there's there's actually good swell going on in Rhode Island, so I'm excited to surf tomorrow morning. <laughs> good stuff. Well, well, thanks for, for for taking the time out. So maybe we always start off by just getting a a quick intro on on people's background and how they got involved in markets and uh, what was the route to your current role. Yeah. So so I think you know for me, you know, I, I grew up in uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania. Fortunately, I was good in you know math and science in school. But, you know, finance was like a checkbook, right? And nobody knew like anything about like hedge funds or, or asset allocation. So went to MIT, studied chemical engineering, um, quickly figured out that uh, I liked people t- far too much to be in a semiconductor fab all day or a lab. And um, fortunately, quite a few of my buddies in undergrad um, went to Sloan and then got these great jobs at hedge funds or prop desks. And I always thought it was fascinating how they could apply a lot of the you know analytical skills that you learn at school, like MIT, to capital markets and have you know re- uh, very thoughtful, productive careers. And and so I kind of think of I got into this business through the back door. I started out doing engineering, was fortunate to transition to a small fund of hedge funds back in two thousand one, which was in the middle of the uh, you know the great dot-com bubble implosion. So kind of a good time to learn that markets don't always go straight up. Although I don't know anyone that studied market history that believes that, but every now and again, you get these periods of time where people somehow do believe it. 
Um, and you know, the gentleman I worked for, uh, was a real student of market history. So whether it's guys like Mark Faber or, um, you know, you think about Charles Kindleberger, you know, just trying to understand market cycles and then trying to figure out, you know, which strategies make the most sense throughout those cycles. And, you know, it, it was fortunate to, uh, manage assets in, in better times. You know, I don't know if you'd call the 04 to 06 bull market or 03 to 06 bull market, you know, the greatest time, but, you know, it was a more normalized environment. And then we obviously went through the global financial crisis. And, you know, the, the thing people forget about the GFC uh, is, you know, you, you already had a test case for it. It was long-term capital management, but the GFC was long-term capital on steroids, right? This X is bad. Uh, and then of course we got into this environment where, so much of uh, market outcomes were driven by just Fed largesse and hyper loose monetary policy and ridiculous levels of asset inflation. And, you know, I think we all know there's a variety of indicators to focus on in markets. But over time, you know, it became very clear that, you know, money supply was a factor that, you know, even the Fed continues to ignore today, um, which is bizarre but we had become so important in driving asset inflation, right? The, the relentless oversupply of, of money really helped drive all asset prices to unsustainable levels. And it would take some type of inflationary period to, to finally cause that to, to end. And, you know, as the uh, incredible stimulus that was necessary originally um, coming through the pandemic really was just extended too far, it became very clear that we would have some type of real economic inflation and the Fed would have to tighten and they'd have to prick, um, you know, an incipient asset bubble. Uh, and, you know, so I think from, from a background standpoint, it's, it's really important to understand market history, try to understand where we are in a market cycle, try to figure out where the best risk reward is in asset classes, given, given the new regime you're in. Um, and at the basic level, you know, a lot of, macro research, you know, a, a lot of investors kind of give up their, uh, or kind of throw their hands up in the air when it comes to macro analysis, because it, 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 it cannot matter for years and then really matter. Um, and even with the best analysis, you're probably only right two out of three times, right? Because there's some paradigm that shifts. But, you know, our, our thoughts are that, you know, look, the most important part of macro is really to try to understand what type of regime you're in, are you in a green light go environment where you want to embrace as much risk as you're comfortable with, like 20 to 21? Or are you more of a, uh, a yellow light caution, orange light extra caution environment where the reality is, is you're just not getting paid sufficiently to take directional risk? And, you know, we'll get more into the, the bigger macro viewpoints in a bit. But, you know, bottom line for us is, you know, we just think with the current cross currents going on, obviously, uh, significantly elevated recession risk, uh, a Fed that's still tightening aggressively. Uh, it's it's very critical to err on the side of caution, right? And and what we refer to is focus on strategies that are in the northwest quadrant in the Fisher frontier, right? Where you're going to take less risk. Uh, and maybe before we get into that, I mean, useful to give a sense. And obviously, FS Investments is a large uh, seventy-five billion dollar asset manager. Can you give us a little bit about what the focus is of the firm in terms of the types of clients you serve and strategies you run? Yeah, so so I think what's what's different about our business than most uh, asset management firms is we we like to say we're not arrogant or naive enough to believe we can do every strategy best in class in house. And uh, so what we mean by that is we, we, whether we're looking at senior secured commercial real estate lending or middle market corporate EBITDA based lending or our multi strategy fund um, or you know, our, our interval uh, fund that's focused on security credit. We're trying to find the best partners that can complement or amplify our own investment expertise and uh, consistently, you know, deliver, you know, upper quartile performance in, in the strategy. And, and you know, so you, you, you can't do everything um, all the time and do it well. So we've tried to be, you know, very selective how we build out the platform. Um, the, originally, the firm was focused on middle market corporate lending, evolved into broader asset classes, senior commercial real estate lending, multi-strategy, tactical asset allocation. Uh, and what we're trying to figure out is, should we run strategies solely in-house, like like we do with our tactical asset allocation fund run by Ryan Caldwell? Should we have 50-50 partnerships? 
like we have with Rialto and, and KKR and, and different lending strategies, or, or should we rely more upon in-house expertise like we do in our multi-strat? And in some cases, you know, the end game is, you know, a combination or acquisition. Uh, as an example there, you know, we, we were looking for years for, for a growth solution. And, you know, most of all we've done at the firm is income oriented, you know, grinded out returns, you know, low vol. Um, but we're clearly not going to build a, a P uh, franchise from scratch or a VC franchise from scratch at this stage of the game. So, you know, we started discussions on partnerships with a firm uh, called Portfolio Advisors, and they're an institutional middle market PE uh, shop. And you know, with right now a heavy focus on secondaries because there's so much going on there. And as the discussions evolved, uh, you know, we ultimately acquired slash combined with them. That was the best uh, uh, way forward. And so we're really excited about that because now we have a growth solution, as you know, in, in, in markets today, liquid markets, you know, you, you have, uh, you've been through another period of rampant asset inflation. It's very hard to find growth at a reasonable price anywhere. So middle market PE with a focus on secondaries is one of the few areas that you can uh, rationally articulate that case. Um, so we're, whether, whether we build it, we, we partner or we acquire slash uh, merge, um, it's sort of an all the above strategy to provide, you know, top, top, uh, top tier outcomes for clients. Okay, very good. Well, you mentioned kind of where we are kind of Northwest in, in the kind of the investing compass uh, at the moment. I mean, it's been an interesting cycle. Obviously, rates have gone from zero to, you know, five, five and a half percent. And uh, without, without, you know, with a little bit of a wobble, no, no major accident yet. So, I mean, maybe just to get firstly from a top-down macro perspective, you say Northwest. Does that mean you're starting to position portfolios with with an eye on potential economic downturn and even recession, or or how 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 are you assessing the the, the landscape? Yeah, so I think you know w- when when you think about the end of 2021, it, it, it was pretty clear at that point that you know the Fed was behind the curve. There there'd be finally real economic inflation. They'd have to tighten certainly more aggressively than 15 to 18. Although to be uh, clear, at the end of 21, we didn't think they'd be hiking to this degree this fast, right? Um, we knew they would have to drain their balance sheet. The question at that point was, you know, how fast, how aggressively. And and as you know, they ended up uh, draining the balance sheet at a target pace of roughly four to five times the last QT. Um, so we knew at that point, y- you really had to focus on protecting capital, uh, moving to Northwest quad- Quadrant strategies. We were exiting what was one of the greatest green light go risk-taking environments in history, uh, 2021. I mean, by by mid-April of 20, it was clear, you know, between the monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus, primarily monetary stimulus, markets were going higher. All assets were going higher. Um, so our, our mantra, really since the end of 21, is when you, when you look at uh, client portfolios, obviously there's typically a large allocation of equities, a larger allocation of fixed income, um, that you, whatever your allocation alternatives or, or cash to be fair was, it should be larger. Right. And, and so, you know, for smaller investors, that might mean taking 2% to five for, for larger, uh, al- asset allocators that embraced alternatives for longer, it might be going from 20 to 25. And, and that's one of the, the really cool stories about last year and even through this year is, you know, there's been a handful of alternative strategies that have really shined, you know, senior commercial real estate lending, multi-strategy funds um, in an environment where, you know, obviously 60-40 last year got completely torched. And, and this year, you know, you're getting some love from the 60, right? From equities have reflated from 15.75 times uh, earnings in last October to now 19.4. But the 40 is still a struggle, right? Like, no, no matter how many times the bond crowd says recession is going to happen tomorrow, recession is going to happen tomorrow, uh, it doesn't make it so, right? So a lot of the use case for alternatives has been to replace fixed income since 2017. Now that markets have reflated again, we're seeing you know more capital roll out of uh, equities just through natural rebalancing. And then you know locally, just to hit your question head on, the, the difference between the end of 21 and today is recession risk is materially higher, right? There was no risk of recession in 21. There is very little to de minimis risk coming into this year. And, you know, fortunately for those that are overweight equities or credit, um, there is a path now to where you could see the Fed being able to thread the needle from an economic standpoint. You know, the combination of state and local government spending, 
uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is obviously driving more construction um, and more uh, business fixed investment. You have housing, which has been a drag on GDP for six quarters, is now flipping to a contributor. You know, there there is a path to getting there. Um, and so we're in we're in this period where you're going from extremely elevated inflation to a, a more manageable number. But along the, that path, as you look forward, recession risk is dramatically higher today than really any time with, with a forward view than since pre-GFC. And so that obviously will work to the detriment of equity markets instead of getting uh, you know, 10 to 14% earnings growth, you, you have you know, 10% uh, contraction that it t- tends to not be a good outcome. And then in the background, you know, the Fed is still draining their balance sheet, like aggressive, right? I mean, QT, when they announced QT in 21, I literally, or 22, sorry, I literally almost fell off my chair because they were, you know, articulating moving at four to five times the pace of the last QT. And we know how that turned out with Q4 of 18. And, you know, they obviously had to take a brief holiday from that during the bank rescue period uh, because of the bank failures in the US. But they're back at it, man. I mean, you, know, you look at the balance sheet every month, it's 80 to 120 billion coming off. And so the p- probability of a liquidity accident continues to go up. And uh, also bank lending is completely stagnated, as you know. It's very tough to grow an economy without bank credit creation. And then we still have a, you know, the yield curve is not as inverted today as it was six weeks ago, but we still have a massively inverted yield curve, right? Which really d- destroys the incentive to create credit for any, any longer maturity loan. So very tricky environment there. You have the combination of continued tightening plus elevated recession risk, which just means, again, when, when you when think about your asset allocation today, um, anyone that's been overweight equities has enjoyed uh, a, a, not a magical levitation, but a substantial levitation in those valuations. Um, you know, when you think of it theoretically, uh, it's, are we more expensive in equities today or the end of 21? At the end of 21, we had slightly higher multiples, 1.8 uh, multiple turns higher, but risk-free was zero, right? Look at it today, we're, we're, we're 1.8 multiples cheaper, absolute, but a risk is five and a quarter to five and a half and could go higher. And obviously the 10 years no longer has a one handle on it. It's got a four handle on it. So, you know, from, from a, from a relative basis, we've only been more overvalued in the dot-com bubble from, a, from an absolute basis. We've only been this rich in 2021 and, and, and obviously the dot-com bubble. Interesting. So, I mean, if you were to summarize all that, I mean, obviously you're advocating more alts and more cash, uh, but it sounds like if you, in a kind of a model uh, multi-asset portfolio, that might be funded more out of equities now, whereas if you went back a couple of years ago, it might have been funded out of uh, fixed income. That's 100% right. I think, and you you know this, Niels, from your rich career, from from really the early 2000s to really set 2016, 17, and, and so much of this was driven by the lost decade, right? Like you had a lost decade, couldn't make money in equities. Most of the allocation to equity markets came, or to, to alternatives came from equity risk. The idea was to sacrifice some return and, and greatly reduce volatility. And then by 16, 17, the, the risk reward of fixed income had gotten you know so um, lopsided that a lot of the uh, use case was as a fixed income replacement. And, and that's continued through today, although clearly there's much better risk reward in cash as well as the back end of the curve. Um, and so with this more localized rally since October, we're seeing more flows come from just again natural rebalancing, right? Like it, that that's the way it works in asset allocation. You should be able to rebalance your your equities, your fixed income, but also your alternatives. And that's one of the nice things about the asset class becoming democratized is even though there's limited liquidity, there's some liquidity to allow people to rebalance. And and we saw that pretty significantly in the real estate market where you know in the uh, Q1 of 22 we launched the roll up the capital structure campaign. Just urging investors, like, hey, if you have risk in real estate, and a lot of it's in the equity part of the capital structure, and, and you've enjoyed not only a, a, a tremendous bull market, but now a hockey stick like move, it might make sense to rebalance and take some of that risk and, and roll up the capital structure to not only reduce risk, but also increase return because senior lending rates are going higher. And I guess one of the interesting features we've had in, like, from an investment asset allocation perspective in the last kind of 18 months or so is last year, every article you read on asset allocation was all about the end of 6040 and how it's dead. And all of them, you know, all of these models have to be uh, adjusted. And coming to this year, and obviously 6040 has done pretty well, as you say, men 
driven largely by equities. So let's talk about the end of 6040. Now, most sophisticated investors are not running 6040, but it's maybe a derivative of it. But where, where do you do you think now, given the overall landscape, there is structurally a, a case for more alternatives? And, and then within that, people talk about alternatives, but the, the label alternatives is so wide ranging, you know, practically. Uh, but what, I mean, how do you, if you're positioning kind of a model portfolio asset allocation approach to clients, do you have a way of, of, of talking about it? Is it 40, 30, 30 now, or is there some kind of derivative around that? Yeah. So, so a lot, a lot to unpack there. I think the, from an, from a, uh, a, an actual math standpoint, right. A, a, so much of it depends on the starting point for the client, right. And how, how far they are along in embracing alternatives. You know, we'll get into the different types of alternatives in a bit, but you know, uh, what we see is that the larger institutions, uh, larger QPs that embraced alts for years are, are more in that, you know, 40, 30, 30 model. You know, in some cases, obviously if it's a, if it's an endowment that's well-funded, they might lean more heavily into fixed income. Um, because all they need is to clear their their spend rate. Uh, obviously, older clients that are more concerned about protecting wealth and, and growing it. Uh, and then the flip side for those that are you know younger in their careers in life. But for some clients, look, they're they're particularly accredited investors. Remember, it's really only the last five to seven years that a lot of these strategies that sovereign wealth funds or Yale's endowment um, had embraced decades ago could actually access right and access in a way where the outcome wasn't. Uh, yeah, the investment outcome didn't deteriorate to some extent because of the structure. So we still run into in, in situations where you know clients have very little alternatives, might be two or three, or, or and, and that might be REITs or MLPs or you know things that you and I like. That's not an alternative, but like in, in a wealth management framework, it is an alternative. Um, so you know, just getting them to five or ten, and I think the. You know, just stepping back again from an asset allocation standpoint, one of the best ways we think to to think about this environment from a forward return expectation for equities uh, or any asset that had been driven to very high valuation levels, principally by Fed largesse, but also by lower and lower interest rates over 40 years and, and globalization, particularly China's entry to the WTO and that tremendous labor shock um, that that not only helped suppress inflation, but helped boost corporate profit margins, the S&P from 5.5% to over 13 recently, is this concept of galactic mean reversion. When you look at a 30, 40 year history, labor market sideways, right? Median wages sideways, real median wages, nominal GDP, substantially lagged asset inflation o- over al- almost every relevant time horizon, whether you look back five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40. And, and so you had rampant asset inflation while nominal GDP chugged along and the labor market stagnated. So the when you think about three of the key factors that drove that, you know, up until the end of 21, you know, one was money supply growth. The Fed consistently grew money supply faster than nominal GDP in the post- uh, global financial crisis period, that provided the liquidity to drive asset prices higher. And of course, it wasn't just the Fed, it was every central bank in the world. So that's clearly been a headwind since the announced QT at Fort Hiking, and really will remain a headwind until we have either a hard landing or some type of market accident. Because we all know, you know, when when unemployment goes to 4.2, the Fed isn't going to panic and cut rates to zero, they're going to be high five at each other, like mission accomplished on inflation. And they're not doing QE again anytime soon, unless there's some type of market catastrophe. Um, so, so that's been a huge tailwind that's now a headwind, as far as I can see. Look, interest rates are not going to be the headwind going forward, meaning higher interest rates that they were last year when 6040 got torched. But they're certainly not going to be the tailwind they were from 1982 to 2021. Right? I mean, we can all factually say that the 10 years not going from 16% to one handle anytime soon, right? So, so that's that's it's not going to be the strong headwind it was last year, but it's certainly not going to be the tailwind. And then when you think about globalization, look, we're still trading. It's not like trade is over, but China's entry to the WTO is so profound in helping to suppress inflation and allow uh, efficient supply chains to build and help uh, boost corporate profit margins. Because as you remember, when they first entered, 
you know, there was a 32 to one labor arbitrage with the U S and that's gradually gone down to roughly three to four. Um, so what that means is it, it doesn't mean we're going to have a lost decade or a 1964 to 1982 period where the Dow was flat. It just means that you have to readjust your forward return expect- expectations for every asset, uh, but particularly those that are dependent upon uh, Fed largesse and, and economic growth. And then the flip side of that is, you know, in, in duration related assets, y- you fortunately have much higher yield than the last five to 10 years, uh, which gives you some recession protection, but in, in cash it is yielding a rate that I don't think anyone foresaw uh, even 18 months ago. But the Fed, again, assuming the next terminal rate stop in a mild recession is three plus or minus, it's not like the 10 years dropping from six to one or, or, or five to two. You'll probably get the 10 year back to three and a three and a quarter, assuming the front's at three. Um, so four to turn expectations for 60, 40, dramatically lower now than over most of our investment careers. Uh, it's not that we're going to have a lost decade, but it's going to be harder to make a buck. And you know, the, the, that's why back to that Northwest Quadrant and Fishing Frontier, if you can generate high single digit returns with far less volatility, more importantly, far less risk of loss, uh, you know, that's something that should be embraced. And so depending on the client's risk appetite, uh, you know, how, how comfortable they are with alternative allocations, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20, it should, be sem- it, it should certainly be higher than it was five years ago. And you touched on, you know, nobody expected rates to get up to this kind of level, five five and a half percent. Are you seeing that in terms of investment uh, or investor reaction? I mean, it strikes me, you know, as soon as the, the, the Nasdaq starts to rally again and, the, the you know, the hyper and NVIDIA, et cetera, people are jumping on that trade and risk sentiment comes back pretty quickly. But as you pointed out, you know, those multiples have to be viewed in the context of that kind of five to five and a half percent threshold. But but do you, are you seeing that in terms of investor behavior yet? People saying, you know what, that looks like a pretty good return for us for the moment. So we're actually going to shift more tactically uh, defensively. Yeah, and Neil's great question. I th- so when you think of flows and you look at flow data, there's really been only two major ships this cycle. And by major, even trillions of dollars, right? Not like, yeah, sure, alternatives have grown and you know, there's been money deployed there, but it's it's tiny relative to you know global uh, flows. So the first is to cash, right? You think about money markets up by about two trillion since pre-pandemic, two trillion plus. So there's there's been a huge embrace of cash. And, and look, bottom line is, an investor should have more cash exposure now than they've had when we were in the zero interest rate or zero policies for years. Um, so that's been a huge uh, driver of flows to cash and and also T-bills. You know, we often meet with advisors or clients who are like, we've been rolling more T-bills than we ever have. Like, uh, never never thought I'd be a a T-bill buyer, but that's that's what I do for a living now. And then the second, of course, and this is more recent, is the flows of capital and cash from regional and community banks to too big to fail banks, right? Given, you know, the unfortunate situation with some of the uh, less stellarly run banks that had problems with their duration. So what can happen though is, you know, there's this concept of inertia and, and there's a lot of inertia in asset allocation, right? Like slow moving, backward looking, making changes after the fact. That can cause folks to freeze up. Be like, hey, you know what? Cash is yielded five and a quarter, five and a half, you know, why do anything? Right. And and again, you, you should look at a higher cash allocation, but you should use this opportunity to to look forward and try to figure out you know which strategies make the most sense in this galactic mean reversion period, and at least start to nibble on them or, or leg into them. Um, and you know even though we've always been in the higher for longer camp, I, I think we do all include now, and by all I mean rational, non biased market observers and and um, economists that there's there's now a path where the Fed can keep rates meaningfully higher for longer. We still think it's unlikely. And that just means that, you know, floating rate lending strategies, for instance, are going to be able to generate more return. Um, floating rate lending strategies that roll the portfolio turns over very rapidly, like senior secured commercial real estate lending, for instance, where they're three-year average term, those those also have floors. Um, so every new loan that's done is a floor that's roughly at sulfur minus 100. So the, the the way I refer to that is the dare to dream scenario, right? Where where if you're a floating rate lender, the front end's going to be higher for longer. 
we can throw off more income. We, we can avoid recession, which again, we still think is unlikely, but could theoretically happen. And every month that goes by, you have more and more floor protection for the next Fed cut cycle. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's for the, for those involved in uh, private real estate lending or middle market corporate lending, that's the dare to dream scenario. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that happens, but we're realistic that more likely than not that we, you know, again, it'll have a mild recession, um, nothing catastrophic like 2008, uh, much more in, in tune with what we had in 01, where GDP only, you know, contracted by 70 basis points peak to trough. Uh, that was more of an asset, you know, bubble implosion period, uh, which obviously we have very similar echoes to today. So, I mean, you mapped out a pretty good uh, rationale for, for bumping up alternatives. And as we said, like alternative comes in many shapes and sizes. And, and I guess what you see with a lot of asset allocators is you may have allocations to, you know, as you say, private equity, VC, real estate, private credit, et cetera. And sometimes it strikes me you've got a lots of shades of kind of equity risk wrapped up in different ways. So, so how do you look at the all space and differentiate between the different types of strategies within all? So is it public versus private or, or what's your kind of uh, framework for, for analyzing the space? Yeah, so, so there's certainly publics versus privates is, is one, of, one of the ways to break down the space. All strategies that focus on liquid securities where risk premia evolve driven by factors that sometimes you can predict, sometimes you can't, are by definition subject to more mark-to-market volatility. Um, and so, you know, managing that volatility, you know, whether it's through a multi-strategy framework, um, trying to generate that consistent return, uh, put on expressions that have the best risk rewards, very, very important. Um, in, in the private space, you know, obviously uh, you're, you're not marking things daily, you know, uh, in, in most cases you're marking things monthly, but there, I think the big differentiation now uh, is, do you want to be in the debt part of the capital structure or the equity part of the capital structure? And, you know, I think as usual, it depends. But, you know, when you think about real estate as an example, you know, from, from really, you know, 2012, 13 to the end of the hockey stick like move uh, in Q1, Q2 of, of 22, you know, if you were in the equity part of the capital structure, not only did you enjoy attractive income, but you enjoyed steady appreciation, and then you captured that hockey stick-like move. But you know, it was very clear at that point that in unless some something completely uh, unrealistic occurs, every asset class was going to give back some of the hockey stick-like move. Right? Equities did obviously last year, kind of reflated. Real estate was going to roll over. Uh, so it became very clear that if you're going to have exposure, you want to be senior in the capital structure where you greatly reduce risk. You don't have the downside capture to beta moving in the wrong direction. Um, and you actually increase your income because the Fed is uh, continuing to hike. Um, so broadly, if you think about real estate, if you have real estate risk, you have to be in the senior part of the capital structure. And, and you mentioned, you know, back to, uh, you know, client experience, you know, what we found is you know, the clients that are more involved in real estate, uh, they, they come to that conclusion much more rapidly than those that are, you know, maybe not as familiar with uh, the asset class and the cycles it can go through. And then, you know, you think about corporate middle, middle market EBITDA-based lending. Let, let's just say, again, I think a real, reasonable expectation, equities annualized to 6% the next 10 years. So not a lost decade, but Certainly not what we experienced from 09 to 21 when equity multiples went from you know nine to 21. Um, we know that's not happening again because we're at 19.4, right? So mm-hmm. let's call it six plus or minus. If if you can start out with 10% uh, income stream um, and and have minimal minimal risk of loss, that that's at least a competitive return stream, potentially better in the senior part of the capital structure, which by definition you have a less risk of loss. Uh, yes, you're not going to capture the upside in equities in years like this, but you're not going to have nearly the downside. So, they're they're actually one of our one of our clients came up with a, a great phrase for this. Uh, I came up with dare to dream, by the way, in Galactic Version, but th- their their term for this environment is give me liberty or give me debt. You know, <laughs> and, and it, it, it happened to be based in in DC, so that was pretty apropos. And, and you know what they're going through in all their client discussions is. Hey, like given where the front end is, and these are floating rate exposures, and the income that you can realize, the total return you can realize, 
let's have a heavy emphasis on senior lending the next several years, whether it's commercial real estate or corporate EBITDA based. And, and that's a very different phenomenon than our environment than we were in for years because people forget that, you know, if you were a floating rate lender, you had these two headwinds for years, right? The Fed never hiked, then barely hiked, then cut by 75, then cut to zero, stayed there too long. So you got no love at all from the front end of the curve, like no love, no love from the Fed. And, and then because you had so much gosh darn liquidity, right? Because M2 is growing consistently faster than nominal GDP, spreads were tighter than they would have been otherwise. LTVs were higher. And now we're in an environment where LTVs are materially lower, spreads are wider, and you're getting tremendous love from the front end of the curve, which could persist at least for another year, if not longer. Interesting. So obviously, you know, commercial real real estate um, and and uh, corporate lending, to, to, two kind of credit based strategies, are, I, I guess. I mean, obviously, you're highlighting the potential uh, attraction there from from an income perspective. Obviously, within commercial real estate, we've heard of challenges, you know, withdrawals, et cetera, BlackRock f- fund. I mean, presumably you have to be selective in that space or is it that valuations have adjusted now and there's attractive opportunities or, or how are you thinking about re- real estate from that perspective? Yeah. So I think big picture, um, if you think about, first of all, you have commercial and residential, right? Which are which are similar but different markets. You know, the, the residential real estate market's much more homogenous, right? Single family homes, um, yes, there are price differences and affordability differences driven by geographic, regional differences in the country, but they all tend to move in lock, lockstep, right? And, and you also have a financing market for residential real estate that's dominated by the agencies um, and with you know implicit and explicit support. So, you know, particularly in the QE era, QE era you you had artificially manipulated low mortgage rates, and now that the Fed's doing QT, and no one in their right mind is stepping in front of that freight train, um, you have extremely elevated mortgage rates. So much more homogenous market. And effectively what's happened, it's really bizarre. As affordability has dropped lower and lower, we, we still uh, have a f- artificial floor under residential housing because no one wants to sell their home and, and move from a 3% mortgage to 7% mortgage. Now, clearly uh, in a mild recession, if rates come down even modestly, uh, that'll unlock some supply, which should lead to another leg down in residential. If you look at commercial real estate, very different, right? Because you, you you have much more heterogeneity uh, of sector, right? There's obviously a huge difference between major metro blue state office towers, which are going through a slow motion train wreck, a complete destruction of equity value. There will be some losses that bleed into senior loans. Fortunately, it's, it's manageable from a banking system standpoint and from you know, an insurance uh, company standpoint, but, you know, lodging's on fire right now. I mean, lodging, you know, got crushed in, in the pandemic and then came ripping back. And it's a sector that's basically, you know, flat to up or down 2% the last 12 months. And then of course you have multifamily, you have bricks and mortar retail, you have industrial, which these days is mainly talking about distribution centers. So, you know, in general, when we think of commercial real estate, for let's call it four to four and a half of the major sectors, we're going through a healthy, higher borrowing cost, higher cap rate price decline. In some cases, there's a small imbalance between supply and demand at the local level. Um, but inevitably, when you have that hockey stick like move up, you're, you're going to come back and we're right back on trend. There's probably you know five or 10% more price declines to come, but we're getting closer to bottom. And then in, in major metro blue state office towers, it, it's just, it is what it is. They're down 30 to 50% in price. And the probability of, of recouping that anytime soon is extremely low. So they have to be obviously very selective by sector, uh, by geography, by quality of borrower. And then you hone in on, you know, what's the appropriate LTV? What's the appropriate spread to sulfur to lend that in the current environment? And because you have this dramatic retrenching of bank lending, banks are still lending, but they're just more, much more cautious. You know, you, you have materially uh, lower LTVs and wider spreads now than, you know, certainly last May prior to some of these uh, unfortunate occurrences uh, in the bank system taking place. So that looks really, really good right now. But ultimately, there still will be more price adjustment in the equity part of the capital structure. You, know, you, you can't have an asset class go up by 20 to 30% that you're levered to and then drop by, you know, 10 to 15 that you're levered to without having, you know, some degree 
of NAV uh, hits. Uh, so that, that'll, that'll, that'll play out over the next year or so. Okay. And in terms of institutional allocators, obviously, you know, prior to 2022, you know, the preceding number of years, the big theme was around this wall of money into privates and particularly private equity, you know, maybe VC to an extent, private credit as well. After last year, obviously, these these uh, uh, allocations are not as fast to adjust and reprice, but presumably allocators have got a little bit overweight on these sectors and have been looking to trim. Um, how do you see that dynamic playing out? And is that presumably then offering opportunities and secondaries as well? Stefan back, when you think about how alternatives have been democratized historically, it, it was always about taking an institutional strategy and packaging in a way that the average investor could access without deteriorating the investment outcome. That was the mission, right? Easy to say, hard to do. Uh, but for a variety of strategies, the industry's gotten there. In private equity secondaries, particularly in evergreen structures where you don't have the J curve, um, particularly focused on middle market because there's far more inefficiencies in the middle market in PE than there are in the, the mega cap buyout size. That this is the first time we've ever seen slower moving, smaller investors be able to pick off larger investors. They, and when we're trying to evaluate the, the forward size of the private equity secondary opportunity, you know, there's a variety of ways to get in there. You can just look at the flow of the last few years and extrapolate that out forward. You can look at, you know, the size of the market and, and put rough percentages over what has to transact. And you basically get to around 500 billion to 750 billion. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, if you think of $5.7 trillion asset class in 70% of all the capital that was ever allocated to private equity came the last five years, much of it driven by institutions. And so what's happened is because um, this, the 40 in particular has gotten torched and hasn't come back, 60 got torched last year, it's come back most of the way, but not fully. Um, if if you're, you were allocated 10% to PE and, and it might be 12 or 13 now, and if your investment policy statement says 10, well, obviously you have to sell down secondary volume to get there. Um, but you have to go a little further because if you want to embrace any newer vintage exposures, you need some, some uh, uh, freedom in your, in your uh, asset allocation limit. And so what, what we're seeing is in, the, in LP-led secondaries, um, tremendous volume at 10 to 30% discounts. And even in GP-led secondaries, you can transact at discounts to NAB, which is uh, a rare thing because there's so much uh, positive selection bias in, in GP led secondaries. Um, and so if you're investing in an evergreen structure, you don't have the J curve, you uh, are in a very unusual situation where you're picking off large institutions that got over their skis and can source secondaries at significant discounts to NAV. And then you immediately enjoy that appreciation. So we think the next two to three years, uh, that will be a very rich opportunity set and they will normalize, you know, there'll still be volume, but we won't have the pricing inefficiencies we have today. And that's one of the reasons when you're looking at an evergreen P structure, you want to make sure it's full cycle, right? It's not, there's been a lot of assets raised recently in secondary only funds and that's great. Go for it. But think of those as more satellite exposures, uh, as your core exposure, you want a full cycle fund. So you're not forced to rebalance or or redeem three years from now when that opportunity goes away. Because oftentimes these inefficiencies last two to three years and then, you know, they go away and, and, and they may come back or they, or they may never come back. Um, and, and so think full cycle, middle market, where you can monetize the secondary opportunity set for the next several years. Okay. And I mean, within the rest of the, uh, I mean, private equity VC space, obviously there's been a markdown in valuations um, and, you know, uh, there's always a debate amongst has that been full, uh, you know, have the, the, the price declines been fully recognized in the valuations? What's your sense on that? Do you think that's still an unfolding process or, or, or has it largely been done? It's a process that's underway, but remember, it, it's a moving target, right? And, and when you think about it simplistically, you had in 20 and 21, you, you had rampant asset inflation for every asset, but particularly in, in public markets. So, you didn't have nearly the same distortions to the upside in private assets, which are typically marked based on the dollar flow or, or LTV or, um, you know, spread, et cetera. 
And and then you didn't experience the same degree of price declines last year, but you certainly experienced price declines. And because you never had the the dramatic multiple expansion, you didn't have as much multiple compression. And then wouldn't you know it, here we are, you know, eight, nine months through this, or I guess eight, uh, eight full months through this year where your public markets are reflated again, right? So in, in evaluation process, you, you need to look at EBITDA, cash flow, and comparable multiples evaluations. And obviously the valuation multiple continues to evolve first up, dramatically up and then dramatically down. And now once again, dramatically up. So I think there's always a lag in how private uh, markets are valued. And it's uh, it's a challenge to get it uh, to the screws, um, but the better firms uh, have very thoughtful processes now. And you know, if you think of simplistically, if you were in a uh, a middle market P fund that uh, was focused on secondaries a year like last year, and you know you made nine percent, well, some of that came from the fact that EBITDA grew faster than multiple compression, but some of it came from secondary exposure as well. You know, being able to 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 you know, take positions in secondaries, write them up from a 20 or 30% discount to NAV. So in general, I think in PE, you've seen uh, less multiple compression last year, but also less multiple, re-multiple expansion this year. And then, you know, we'll obviously get into discussions on more liquid markets where, you know, things are priced, you know, much more frequently. And, and that conversation goes completely out the door. Well, that's a good way. Said. I mean, that was my next question. In the in the liquid space, obviously, you have a whole plethora of possible uh, strategies from global macro to managed futures trend following, volatility trading, market neutral strategies. So how are you thinking about, one, what do you think about the opportunity set for those types of strategies at the moment? And how you how do you position those within a portfolio alongside the the kind of the, the the private market allocations yeah no so so obviously a lot of it's dependent upon the mandate of the, of the strategy right so if you look at uh, a, a multi-strategy fund whether it's a, a hedge fund or something wrapped in a daily liquid wrapper you know the mission is typically to generate consistent returns you know high single digits low volatility low beta low you know low to no duration and just grind it out you know uh, you, you brought up managed futures. Managed futures, very different mandate, right? Those are really there to provide explosive performance when you get massive trends in markets, right? And you typically get massive trends in markets during uh, regime shifts or, or, or bear markets. And, you know, I think the last 18 months, so like our, our, our hats off to managed futures because not only did they do a great job last year, but, you know, this has been a very different type of environment to last year, but they've generated positive returns this year as well. But within, you know, multi-strategy, you know, a few of our favorite themes this year, you know, one has been the return of another secular slowdown in prepayment or refi activity in, in the uh, U.S. residential uh, housing market. And you know, when you go back and think about the last time there was a tremendous secular slowdown in prepayment activity, it was coming out of the global financial crisis where you had a housing bubble and, and home prices collapsed. And that drove already elevated LTVs, you know, 60 LTV goes to 90, 80 goes to 110, 90 goes to 120. And so even though rates dropped dramatically, right, Fed took front end zero, 10 year went to two briefly, um, you know, it was very difficult to access uh, the refinancing capability unless you kicked a lot of equity into your home, right, or wrote a big check. So we, we had a, we had a multi-year period where, you know, prepayment speeds were very slow. A tremendous cash flow, and you have markets eventually recognized that new regime and and priced it in, and, and you had wonderful spread tightening. Uh, so, still arguably the greatest uh, trade I've ever seen because you you could study it, you could analyze it. It wasn't like the subprime short where you had to be there, and then when twelve months it was over, and you had some ugly short squeezes throughout the period. So this time around, you know, it was clear we were having another hockey stick like moving housing affordability is dropping like a stone. At, at some point when affordability met or exceeded uh, the 06 lows, you, you were going to get some degree of correction. So we were lining this up for a while. You know, We wanted to make sure home prices had peaked because from April 2020 to Q1 of 21, prepayment sensitive RMBS is one of the few areas that actually didn't make money. Like try to find something that didn't make money in that period. And, and the reason was Home prices were screaming higher, so the cash out refi machines was cranking again. 
And also you had mortgage rates that were still artificially compressed by, you know, QE infinity. Fast forward the clock to today, you know, the main driver of refi, uh, refi is collapsing is that mortgage rates have just gotten to levels that uh, are just ridiculous, right? There's no incentive to refi at all anytime soon. Um, but then on top of that, you have had, you know, a modest correction in, in home prices, which could act as a break in the event that rates drop further. So that expression is is really cool because the core asset that we own um, are interest only strips, and those have negative duration, uh, tremendous positive cash flow, benefiting from slow refi activity, and then because we don't want to speculate on on interest rate direction, we we, we buy back duration through agency pass throughs. And if you've paid any attention to the long only fixed income crowd, they they love like agency pass throughs because spreads are as wide as they've ever been other than the GFC period, right? Where yet garbage credit quality, no one really knew if the agencies were solvent. And of course they weren't without a government bailout. Um, now you have great credit quality. Uh, there's no concerns about, uh, you know, a, a 40% drop in home prices uh, and you have slow speed. So it's an interesting setup because, you know, we love the core asset, the, the cash flow, And we also really, really like the hedge, right? And as you know, like, you know, so you can make money on both sides. They're both positive carry and there's room for material spread tightening in both. We don't think the spread tightening is happening anytime soon because of QT. Uh, but in the meanwhile, you're earning a very attractive non-correlated uh, carry stream. And then, you know, on even a more liquid expression side, uh, we've been big fans of yield curve steepeners coming into this year, right? And, and this, this central thesis has been, okay, when have we been this inverted before? Oh yeah, the seventies and the early eighties. What's the probability that we go into or or we enter a seventy style outcome? It wasn't zero, but it was very very low. Like the Fed was clueless originally. They got religion. They tightened aggressively. Massive QT. So one way or the other, curves are going to steepen, right? In in the mini banking crisis that we had, it was a bull steepener. Uh, the last six weeks, it's been a bear steep, right? Because inflation expectations have uh, become more elevated and the the higher for longer regime is being priced into global fixed income. So we think there's tremendous risk reward there. And that's an area that we've traded around uh, quite substantially. Again, it's not speculating on duration. It's just saying the probability of the yield curve steepening is excessively high. And you're at some of the most extreme levels of inversion in history other than the 70s or early 80s. And maybe more generally, obviously, there are two very specific trade ideas, which make a lot of sense. If you were, if somebody was coming to you saying, okay, I wanted to build out a diversified liquid alts portfolio, how would you think about that? Or, or what would be the components that you would include in it? Yeah. So, so I think if you're starting uh, on the liquid space, you still want to focus to some extent on hedge funds. One of the issues with, let's call it the platform hedge funds is that, you know, they're, it's all about supply demand and there's so much demand for, you know, that very unique, uh, exposure. And there's just not that much supply that the terms have become very, very investor unfriendly, not just in terms of fees, but in terms of liquidity profile, you know, tax treatment is poor because of the, you know, the, the exemptions that are used to, to not be subject to, uh, short selling and wash rules. Um, and, and so those platforms, have become very hard to access. But if you can get some supply, it makes sense to take some of that down. Uh, managed futures, another area, you know, you don't want to make it a large allocation, but something at least uh, meaningful enough that you can protect in the downside. And then where you can find, you know, more user-friendly uh, multi-strat exposures that are might not necessarily perform to the same degree as some of the uh, well-known platform hedge funds, but can you know generate six to ten percent returns with very low uh, volatility, low beta, that are super user friendly. You know that's something that you can access, and then you can rebalance in the future. You know where if imagine you uh, have a private equity allocation, and you have a bunch of capital calls coming, you can make an allocation. You can make a strategic allocation of five percent within your overall asset allocation, and, and never touch it. Just allocate and forget about it. Right? It's it's the it's the last thing you worry about in years like like last year. Obviously, it lags equities this year, but once again, outperforms fixed income and cash. Um, so those are some of the tools in the toolbox right now that 
the first is is very hard to access. The last is the last is very easy to access. And you know, within managed futures, you still have to focus on the sub advisor or the uh, the the manager's ability to to at least perform in line with the asset class, but hopefully add some alpha on top of that. Okay. And I mean, where does the old school global macro fit within all of this now, do you think? I mean, has that been kind of replaced by the, the rise of the platforms and the multi-strats? So macro is still, you know, as a strategy, uh, a, a viable choice, um, but they're much more volatile, similar to systematic trend followers. And systematic trend followers are, are just easier to scale, right? So if you think about the great systematic trend followers, it's, it's been a more scalable strategy um, whereas in, in macro, you think about it in some years, you, you get no swings at the back, right? Like, or at the plate, I should say, right? It's, there's just nothing to do, right? Like nothing to do. Um, in years like last year, where you have such profound shifts and in inflationary expectations and interest rates, there's a ton to do and they kill it. Um, and then you have years like this where they get bulldozed by, you know, bear market rallies or the start of a very short uh, cyclical bull market. And a lot of the uh, more bearish expressions and rates just didn't work out early in the year. And then they gave up on them. And wouldn't you know, we finally get a, a bear steeper. So, so I think, I think macro as a strategy still has a place. It's just, there's far fewer options there um, as an allocator. And you, you, like all volatile asset classes, it's not just timing entry. It's also timing exit. Right. You got to time them both, right? Like if, if you time the entry well, cool, but you got to be ready to harvest some gains. And, and that's very, very difficult to do for anyone repeatedly. Um, and then again, we if, imagine we're in this galactic meter version environment and, you know, rates are pegged higher for longer and, you know, equities appreciate, but very modestly. And, you know, yeah, cur- dollar weakens, dollar strengthens, dollar weakens, dollar strengthens. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how great your team is. There's just nothing to do, you know? So I think in general, the allocators have preferred more consistent return strategies that they don't have to time entry and exit perfectly. Very good. Maybe I'm just conscious of time. Just one topic I want to get your thoughts on briefly. Obviously, AI has been a big driver of the equity run-up, you know, NVIDIA and tech stocks recently. I mean, what's your perspective on that? And are you seeing that as something AI-related strategies, obviously within the managed futures, quant space, you do see that an extent. Is that, are you seeing more kind of machine learning type strategies or, or is that still a little bit down the way in terms of something being really interesting as an allocator? Yeah, so I think for, for AI, just from its impact on markets, like obviously um, it was the f- one of the fundamental uh, fuels of this recent rally, meaning, you know, you have this transformational technology. As we know so far, really NVIDIA is the only company that's been able to monetize it in a big way. Uh, but there's obviously lofty expectations for the rest of the Magnificent Seven somewhere or the other profiting from it. Um, and, you know, just a uh, anecdotal observation, what, what's interesting about this uh, period is when when you see a new technology, you have those that start to try to explain market price action by like, hey, AI is going to add 120 basis points to US total factor productivity. And it's like, really? Like that was that was greater than electrification or or the locomotive. But sure, you know, I, I know I know where you're coming from. I know you're trying to justify valuation. So come up with your your pie in the sky uh, theory. But I, I think, you know, when we think about it simplistically, um, if you're if you're more in the like this is going to be truly transformational. Then you're you're more in the eight percent equity return range going forward. If if it adds modest uh, productivity, you're more at six. And if it turns out to be a dud, which we don't expect, it'll be more like four. But in terms of strategies, like it's it's really being embraced as you articulated by more of the quant side, as one would expect. Um, it, it's still, I think, a to be determined how transformational it's been because. That's one thing that I, I think we all probably gloss over too much. When you think about these systematic trading strategies, they're constantly innovating, right? Constantly innovating. And, and, and the trick to them has always been to innovate enough in real time that you're recognizing which factors are actually important in this market regime without data fitting, right? Like data fitting is, is the death of all quantitative strategies. And, and that again, sounds easy, but very, very hard to do. And so 
AI gives those firms one more tool in their toolbox to help evolve in real time, maybe more rapidly. Um, and it's certainly an arms race there, right? Just like it is in the platforms for, for major talent, uh, just like it's an arms race or a land grab and, and penetrating retail alternatives. Um, there's a multitude of, of, of kind of arms races and, and land grabs going on right now. Um, and AI is certainly a, a, a small part of that. I wouldn't consider it, you know, a, a, the begin all and end all, but certainly will be more important over time. Good. So for maybe just to wrap up, we always ask our guests uh, any brief advice for people starting off in the industry in terms of things to read, things to do, things that have been a big influence on you and, and your career. Yeah. So I think from just a career building standpoint, um, you know, if you uh, obviously have a quantitative background, or um, you know some engineering experience, you're probably a good problem solver. You probably know how to use you know basic quantitative tools to help enhance your investment process. It's I think it's very important to go through uh, the CFA program. I'm I'm a little biased because I, I thought it was very challenging. Um, you know, it definitely demonstrates that you can work super hard at your core job and have the the time commitment um, to you know broaden your understanding of even, you know, basic accounting or, you know, maybe, you know, areas of, of finance that you're less familiar with from your undergrad or even your, your MBA. I, I think, uh, you know, market history, as I alluded to before, is so important to understand. And I've always thought that Charles Kindleberger's uh, of Medias, Panics and Crashes is a must read for anyone, right? That, that doesn't mean every day you wake up, here comes the next panic or crash or media. But these patterns all repeat themselves, right? And having some framework for how, like one of our expressions is every cycle is different, but every cycle is the same, right? There are different drivers of, of euphorias. There are different drivers of panic. There's different drivers of corrections or, or bull markets. But ultimately, the price action is pretty similar, right? Like we, we, we talked about, I think, before we, we started, you know, the global financial crisis was the worst thing that just about everyone had seen. But- the long-term capital management, the failure there uh, and the Russian default, y- you ended up with very similar price action just driven by different factors. Now, obviously, the GFC was long-term on steroids. And then the pandemic, you had basically 18 months of GFC price action in like six to eight, 10 weeks, depending on the asset class. So you know, having that um, understanding of market history is very, very important. I'd recommend to everyone to, to read of Media's Panics and Crashes just to have a level set on how cycles work and that every time people think something's different, well, it, it's partially because things are different, but it's the same general market behavior. Very good. Well, this has been a great conversation, Troy. Thanks very much for, for joining us today. So make sure to follow Troy's work because, as you know, it's uh, a, quite an, an uncertain environment we're living in today. So very important to know how to allocate capital and be well informed on global macro developments. So from all of us here at Top Traders Unplugged. Thanks for tuning in and we'll back we'll be back soon. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.